warm welcome to all of you. Uh, I'm Robert Dijkroff, uh, Director of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this session, Blue Sky Research to Prepare for an Uncertain Future, presented by the European Research Council and the Coffee Prize. What makes frontier research, driven by the interest and passions of talented scientists, such an unreasonably effective tool for progress, securing our well-being and health, creating a better future for all? Well, in the midst of this pandemic, there's little need to argue for the importance of scientific research. But in this session, we will try to take a wider perspective. How can society best prepare itself for future challenges? most of them yet unknown. And how can we make sure that the next generation is motivated to explore this great ocean of discoveries that lies ahead of us? Well, we address these existential questions and others with a panel of the four most distinguished scientists, two laureates of the Nobel Prize and two of the Coffee Prize. They have each created scientific breakthroughs at the very highest level that have changed our world and their unique position to guide and advise us on how to go forward. But first, let me give the floor to uh, Commissioner Maria Gabriel to make some introductory remarks. She has been European Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education and Youth since 2019. That must be surely the most interesting and challenging portfolio. And before that, she held the position of European Commissioner for the Digital Economy Society and was a member of the European Parliament. Commissioner, we are incredibly honored that you are willing to be with us and to frame and to bless our discussion. So please uh, take the floor for the screen. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Robert, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen. What a honor for me to be here together with you. Thank you very much for participating in this extraordinary panel. I would like really to, to say since the beginning that it's really with people like you that we can bring more and concrete answers to the challenges that we are facing today, especially because you are not only people with vision, with ideas, but you already bring to us concrete results. At the same time, you opened new scientific avenues to the world. And as we know, this panel will discuss the nature, the benefits, the practices and challenges of basic research. Dear Robert, I very much appreciate that you would like, that you would like to widen a little bit the perspectives. And this is very important not only for us, for Europe to recover, but it's important for the future of Europe. And that's why I think that this panel is extremely timely because we can address some of the most important issues linked to the basic research, but with these issues, we can really bring answers to the future of Europe. Because we all know that if researchers were able to achieve great results, it's because underneath their talent there is the irresistible attraction to knowledge, to understand better the world surrounding us. And this trigger of curiosity is an essential element of science and research in all its forms. And it is at the basis of creation, creation of new knowledge, creation of technology, when knowledge is mature to become know-how. I think Europe needs a good balance of both. And for this, we need to ask pertinent questions. It is also important for me as Commissioner for Research, Innovation, Education, Culture and Youth. And let me kick off the discussion by asking two questions myself. The first question is, we are very proud with our European Research Council. But when the European Research Council was created to support frontier research, it was argued at this time that the classical distinction between basic and applied research had lost relevance. So my first question is, what has changed since then? Is science a continuum or rather more and more interdisciplinary? Is the distance from ideas to implementation narrowing? And of course, a question for our young people, how really to bring 
our younger generations to the science because you are just making them dream. And if you allow me, let me ask a second question. For policymakers, and I guess for all citizens, the problem is that the sky is not always blue. Sometimes it takes dark colors. That's what happened now with the COVID-19 crisis. And still, we have to be quick taking decisions, asking the support of the wider scientific community to help society and economy to stand up to the crisis. And how can frontier research be part of the solutions, maintaining its fundamental long-term basis? How can protagonists of the best science, known for their achievement and public recognitions, help to bring science closer to citizens when they look for a direction? I leave here these thoughts, which I hope could animate your discussion. And before I leave, wishing you a lovely, li lively debate, I would like to thank the two organizers of this session. We are really proud to be partners, the Kavli Foundation, and let me here pay tribute to the late Fred Kavli, visionary and co-founder of this important prize, and the European Research Council, you know, you know how much you are the jewel in our crown and will be there to support your activities. Special word for Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, because we are living extraordinary times. And I would like just to say thank you, President, because your support, your knowledge, your experience, it's crucial for us in this period. And we count on all of you. You can count on my support. That's my final word. You have a lot of other things to say. So for me, it's a great pleasure to listen to you and to learn because what you make at your best lifelong learning, it's with basic science, with frontier research science. So for me, it's just a honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner, for these uh, inspiring words, but also for your excellent question that I think we definitely will weave into our discussions. I actually want to start by briefly introducing our panelists. Now, I could easily fill this hour by reading their full CVs and the many medals and prizes they have, have uh, earned. So I will have to be very short. So uh, with us, we have Jennifer Doudna, who is Professor of Chemistry and Molecular Cell Biology at the UC Berkeley. Um, she was awarded numerous prizes, but including the 2018 Coffee Prize for Nanoscience, and she's world famous for being the co-discoverer of CRISPR, the revolutionary technology that allows scientists to edit the genetic information DNA, and that caused a revolution in biology, agriculture, and medicine. Sir Christopher Pizzeridis is Regius Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics and Professor of European Studies at the University of Cyprus, where he was born. His work focus on macroeconomics. In 2010, he was awarded the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences for the analysis of markets with theory of serious friction. And his research concerns the economics of unemployment, especially flow jobs, quite relevant, I think, to the current situation. Then Evine van Dishoek is professor of molecular astrophysics in Leiden University and currently the president of the International Astronomical Union. Uh, she was awarded the 2018 Kaffee Prize in Astrophysics for her observational, theoretical, and laboratory astrochemistry, elucidating the life cycle of interstellar clouds. And then finally, Sir Peter Radcliffe holds positions in London, where he's director of clinical research at the Francis Crick Institute, as well as Oxford University. He's best known for his work on cellular reaction to hypoxia, the lack of adequate supply of oxygen in the body for which he shared the 2019 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. So uh, I couldn't think of a more uh, you know, prestigious and qualified panel. And I want to start by asking you, you now we are clearly in the middle of a pandemic that calls upon science in an unprecedented way, also by basic frontier science. And so let's start with that. And, and Jennifer, I know you're, you more or less dropped everything and started working on COVID collaborating with companies and universities. 
can you say what's what your lab currently doing and what is the role indeed of frontier researchers in fighting this pandemic thank you i think the role of science right now couldn't be more important and in my own research I'm doing two things. One is running a clinical testing laboratory to provide coronavirus testing to people, especially those in need uh, here in the U.S. who would not otherwise have access to coronavirus tests. And the other thing we're doing is developing a CRISPR-based diagnostic that will provide point-of-care testing in the future at a lower cost and a higher turnaround rate because we can see that we are going to be living with this pandemic for the coming months, uh, potentially beyond uh, the coming uh, next year. And so it's going to be essential to provide uh, real-time screening for this virus. Beyond that, I'm working hard with an institute I started at the University of California called the Innovative Genomics Institute, to provide research funding to groups around California who are working on the virus uh, using various creative approaches in both therapeutics and diagnostics. And I think that's the kind of innovation that we need right now, scientists to drop what they were doing and focus on this uh, current pandemic. And it's been quite, quite rewarding to see the creative work that is being done by scientists of all ages, especially students. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. So, of course, it's not only biomedical research that's relevant. And I want to uh, move to uh, to you, sir, Christopher. Uh, the pandemic had enormous impact on our econom economy, on society at large. And there are also opportunities. People talk also about a great reset. I know you are advising governments on how to move forward, uh, particularly, you know, protecting the vulnerable parts of society, uh, jump-starting the econo economy. Can you say something about the role of social scientists in general, I think, uh, but you know, the whole scientific community in, in advising society? Please uh, unmute your microphone. I'm sorry. Uh, I repeat, uh, I mean, there's no doubt that uh, COVID has changed completely uh, the course of economies, both in terms of uh, uh, their uh, growth, uh, actual experience and potential, but also in terms of the structural transformations that we see taking place in economies uh, all the time. And um, my work has always been um, focused on the implications of uh, economic performance for the uh, uh, excluded or poorer sections of society, those that have been left behind. That's why I focused on unemployment for most of my work and studying uh, markets that fail to function uh, uh, properly. And um, that's been the focus of my research uh, now, seeing uh, what the implications of the pandemic are on jobs, what governments can do uh, to help it, and especially uh, at the end of the pandemic, because hopefully there will be an end, and hopefully in the uh, near immediate uh, future rather than a very distant one. Um, how can we make sure that um, we get into a better society, if you like, than the one uh, we had before? Because we're observing many changes in the, in the economic society. Um, by economic society, I mean the way that uh, economic... Uh, the way that work is arranged and the way the economy is functioning, we're moving more online. Uh, we're trying to avoid uh, jobs that involve going into very dense environments. Uh, how that is going to change uh, work? And that's really a, a difficult thing to do because uh, this uh, pandemic we have now is new. We don't have data to study, and that's the great big obstacle in economics how to uh, find relevant data to test things. We don't have laboratories to do that. Um, and um, that's basically what uh, I'm doing. And you mentioned advising. I'm advising the, the Greek government on its um, the program of recovery post-pandemic. Uh, and, and, and it's difficult. You know, it's a difficult thing to do. But that's what exciting research is about. 
address difficult problems and uh, see what solutions you find. And at the same time, I'm doing some theoretical research on uh, flows of uh, people from the infectious state to uh, uh, immunity uh, to before, which is, uh, by complete coincidence, is very, very closely related to my work on unemployment. Because when I studied unemployment, as, as you mentioned at the introduction, the whole idea that I was using was that we have uh, two groups of people, one is employed, the other is unemployed, and we move from one to the other. And the epidemiology models have two groups of people, one is uh, susceptible to a disease, the other is infected, and they move from one to the other based on contacts. So, so we're doing some fundamental uh, cure research uh, on the uh, pandemic, which hopefully will bring some uh, benefit in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, it's, it's wonderful that you're also indicating how like intricately the various strands of science are, are entangled you know, in, in this response. Uh, I want to, to move to you, uh, Sir Peter, um, you know, and I want to basically ask you two questions. So on the one hand, your, your, your work that earned you the Nobel Prize, uh, on, among others, on, on silent hypoxia it turned out to be quite relevant in COVID. But I also want to ask you something else, you know. Um, do you feel that this pandemic should change the way in which research is performed and funded? And, and to be perhaps a little bit of a devil's advocate, isn't there also a risk that we are focusing too much on COVID and somehow forgetting other worthy causes? Uh, th thank you, Robert. Uh, it's an important question. I think we do need balance. Um, to an extent, I'm, I'm with um, Jennifer. Um, one thing that Francis Crick Institute did of immediate importance was to set up uh, testing for patients to, to, to supplement the NHS. So there are things we could and should do immediately. But let us be clear, there are major differences in, in our approach to this epidemic uh, from what might have been taken 100 years ago in the flu epidemic. Uh, we, we know um, the basis of um, genetic information. We know the polymerase chain reaction we, is used in the diagnosis. We know the basis of immunology. Uh, we know a certain amount about drug treatments. And none of these things were designed with the idea of uh, treating COVID, but yet they are fundamental, at least to the diagnosis of COVID and our management of the epidemic at the moment. So there is and will continue to be uh, all sorts of ways in which science could and should continue, uh, which have a grade of relevance from, for COVID from immediate relevance to perhaps very long-term issues. So I, I really do not think it will be helpful to refocus entirely on, on the new problem. Thank you so much. Um, in fact, this might be a good point to uh, slightly kind of move our, 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 our lens to a wider perspective. And uh, you know, as I said in my introduction of research, scientific research has this amazing ability to kind of solve problems that we wouldn't know that we would get in the first place. And so I want to turn to you, Avina. You know, can you say something about like how does science manage to do so? And perhaps also you know, in your own personal case, you know, how do you approach this kind of unknown, the great unknown? Uh, you know, sometimes we, you, know, you, you clearly all have been extremely successful in achieving certain goals, but I'm sure there were also failures. Perhaps there was a role of, of serendipity in your research. How do you feel that you know, science is able to address these kind of great issues that aren't, in some sense, obviously in our minds. Well, indeed. Uh, thank you, Robert, uh, for this uh, question. Um, indeed, uh, uh, as a researcher, um, and certainly when you're writing your thesis, you're going into the unknown. You don't know what you're going to find uh, in terms of an answer. And that is actually the important thing that we are doing in terms of training young people as independent thinkers, as people that can go into uh, sort of the dark, into the unknown and come up with innovative and creative solutions, uh, the, the ones that uh, Jennifer um, was already uh, alluding to. Um, so because the, the, the major 
challenges that we have uh, in society today, uh, like climate change, like clean energy, like the current health crisis with COVID, um, they're all very complicated. And you need to be able to step back and look at the problem at sort of a systems level and, and think about sort of innovative ways of, of tackling it. Yes, there is the immediate on the ground, but there is also the longer term perspective of, of how to, to address these uh, um, questions. And for that, you need innovations. Uh, often, you know, that were invented already 20 years ago um, or more. Uh, new technologies, um, how to deal with big data, for example. Um, that, is, uh, that is one uh, example that comes to the forefront now. But also new technologies like Wi-Fi, for example, was invented many years ago, decades ago. Um, actually is coming out of part of astronomy. Um, and um, I don't think we could live without Wi-Fi at this moment and not even have this conversation um, at this uh, this point. So uh, there are all kinds of these, these uh, sort of discoveries and new technologies that need to be developed. Um, and people, young people that need to be trained in the scientific methods. Um, that ultimately is what society needs uh, to move forward in the longer run. Thank you so much, uh, Evina, and also for emphasizing uh, this kind of long-term view of, of basic science. And you know, uh, I think part of our arguing here in this panel is that there are, there are indeed these long lines. Uh, but I, I want to turn to you, Jennifer, because on the one hand, I think you know, with, with CRISPR, we have seen that you know, this could have never happened if you know, not many decades before uh, DNA was unraveled. But I would say there's also a flip side to this. You know, sometimes research takes a very long time to go from, say, the lab to the clinic, but sometimes it's surprisingly fast. And I, I would say, like in your case, perhaps your surprise was how how soon this could be applied and uh, how how relevant it was. Was was that actually the case for you? Thank you for the question, Robert. And absolutely, I think the, a big surprise in my field is exactly what you said, the speed at which the CRISPR genome editing technology is being applied to real world problems. A great example of that is in clinical medicine, it's already been announced that a woman has been cured of sickle cell disease using the CRISPR technology. This is truly extraordinary to go from a fundamental discovery um, to eight years later, a person actually treated effectively using that technology. I don't, I don't know, I, I can't think of another example right now in, in biomedical science of something proceeding that quickly. And so we can ask why, why did this happen? And I think it speaks to the fact that uh, as uh, the other speakers have brought up, there's extraordinary opportunities right now in science that bring together people from different disciplines that uh, allow academic scientists like us to work with companies where appropriate and uh, to be able to attract the interest of some of the most talented young scientists who see opportunities for their work to have a near-term impact. And I do find that in my own uh, teaching and students that I, that I work with, that is consistently a theme that I hear. They feel very deeply that they want their science uh, to be effective in, in, in the near term. And that's not to say they don't want to innovate and, and uh, think of long-term goals. It's just that they want to feel that their work is going to improve the human condition in tangible ways. And I think that's, that's very exciting and it's something that we need to, to balance with the need to do fundamental long-term research with uh, long-term long goals. And, uh, you know, that's, that's just a it's, a, it's always gonna be a, uh, a bit of a balance in science that one tries to strike is going after the, you know, the swinging for the fences, as we call it in, in America, and um, at versus, uh, you know, really uh, buckling down and, um, and, and making practical advances in the short term. Thank you, Jennifer. And I think, you know, both kind of working scientists have a, at least a gut feeling that indeed this is a, is a wonderful investment to, to do these researchers. And 
Now, indeed, very motiv highly motivated that the young generation wants to also use this knowledge to create a better world. But we are very lucky to have an economist on our panel. So I, I want to ask you, Chris, you know, from your field, you know, is, is, is there a way in which can we more quantify and argue more rigidly you know, about the benefits of frontier research for society? And it's in some sense the argument that we would make now in 2020 a different argument because as, as Jennifer was saying, no, we also see that this fundamental research is now impacting society in a much more direct way. It's true, well, but it's also true for many other fields. Mm. Uh, 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 economics is very similar, actually, maybe uh, surprisingly to, to what was uh, said just now. The only difference with the kind of economics, at least that I do, is that the impact is on the economy as a whole rather than to individuals. I cannot say that there's been a major discovery in economics which helped a certain person in some location become healthier or happier or enjoy a higher standard of living. It's more, we're more talking about the economy as a whole. How does it uh, work? Um, I, I, I can give you a very good example if uh, you give me two or three minutes. For example, before COVID, uh, I thought the, the biggest problem that labor markets uh, were facing, that jobs were saving, you know, jobs that ordinary people have, people like us you know, and, and, and everyone else in the market, was that there was a process of automation that was taking over certain kinds of jobs. And the challenge was how do we make those workers move from the sectors getting automated to other sectors? And I'm very pleased to say, by the way, that the, the results I'm going to give you, the research that we're doing, was funded by the European Research Council through an advanced grant to the University of Cyprus, for which I'm extremely grateful, of course, I always uh, said to them. And um, what uh, we were discovering to, to doing research there was that uh, workers needed different skills. They needed more social skills because the jobs that were being created to take them on were jobs that involved direct human contact. There were jobs going into the health sector, into the hospitality sector, those types of jobs. And, and, and we, we could handle, we could advise governments on how to handle the transition. Suddenly COVID arrives and it, it basically shuts down the jobs that were being created. Uh, and it accelerates the automation because that's what we're seeing companies doing now. So that challenge we had has become a challenge times 10. And it's something that we don't know what to do anymore because the um, t transitions are not as smooth as they were before. The jobs that are going to take them on are not being created. We get a uh, rise in unemployment. We get government supporting them. Th that's where uh, sort of fundamental research and also bringing in uh, health uh, research and uh, sociology, psychology, how that affects people, education research, where th we all come together to see what can we do to get a better functioning economy in the COVID uh, world? And, and that's where you sort of do research without realizing that it's going to have an application to something new like, like COVID. And suddenly you discover that you need more data, you need more research, you need more funding, if I can put it as bluntly as that, uh, to, to, to do the research. That, 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 those are the problems that uh, concern us, really. How to advise government to improve and the companies in the world to improve the operation of the economy as a whole for the benefit of uh, uh, people who need to work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I want to move to another theme that, uh, Irina, you already mentioned, which is that you know, we all we clearly have four brilliant minds with us. But, you know, progress is not only made by our, our minds, but also facilities, technology. Uh, you know, you're an astronomer, you're looking through telescopes that have become larger, uh, in fact, are often created in huge international collaborations. Um, and can you say something about the technology? But also, what I find quite fascinating is that there are, are many companies interested to work with you, basically to be on the cutting edge of science, because it's, it's also these, these technologies that you as an astronomer have to develop are also of extreme use to uh, real-world problems. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Robert. Indeed, uh, progress in astronomy, but also physics and uh, increasingly also in the life sciences is driven by having access to large infrastructure, to large telescopes, uh, bigger telescopes, bigger uh, facilities like CERN, like synchrotrons, um, etc. And these are all uh, beyond the capabilities of a single um, country, um, sometimes even uh, a single continent. Um, we have worldwide collaborations now to build uh, the, world, the, the, the most powerful telescopes. Um, and at the same time, indeed, um, by asking our questions, uh, we also drive the technologies. Uh, for example, we want to be able to have sort of the sharpness to be able to read a traffic sign where Jennifer is located at this, uh, at this very moment. Um, we want to be able to have the sensitivity to see, say, uh, a candle somewhere on the moon in on um, uh, around Jupiter. Um, so we are sort of pushing technologies further than they have been pushed before. And uh, that requires a lot of R&D to get there. But once you get there, you have trained the engineers and then they can use that knowledge. And that is often done in companies. Uh, to be able to apply it to elsewhere in society. So indeed, it's uh, both the uh, building of the large facilities, which of course involves um, very big companies, but also the technology, the, the training of the engineers having also something, some really, really exciting and a challenge for them to work on um, that also drives this, uh, this forward. Thank you. And also kind of uh, thank you for showing that this kind of difference between applied and fundamental is, uh, is is almost impossible to make because they are so much uh, part of, of one organic structure. Uh, I now want to move to something that our uh, commissioner suggested we should address. Uh, basically, the uh, the dark side uh, of science, you know, it's, it's not only creating progress, it's certainly building our resilience. Um, you know, science also has dual uses. It can be used as a source for good, but also can be used irresponsibly. Uh, and now these days, there's a lot of questions about, you know, particularly the issues around gene editing. And I'm very happy that we have two great biologists on our panel. Um, and I want to ask uh, both uh, Jennifer and, and Peter to say something about, you know, I would say also the risk and of, of moving forward fast um, in, in this direction. Uh, we have read about CRISPR babies uh, in China, um, but also, you know, what can we do in order to bring, so to say, the public society with us and do it in a responsible way? So I first want to ask Jennifer and then move to Peter. Thank you for that question. It's a very important point. We see advances in science and technology that have the potential for positive impact in the world, but as with, with uh, any, any technology, there's also the potential for risk. And, and in the case of CRISPR, we've seen that very clearly with the use of CRISPR technology in human babies. Uh, that work was announced about a year and a half ago, actually almost two years ago now. And um, I think it's had a very interesting effect. Uh, I've been involved in the discussions around the ethics of genome editing for the last five years. And what's happened is that there's, uh, there's been increasing public awareness of these issues, along with, I think, growing scientific commitment globally to addressing these issues up front and to creating an environment of transparency where applications of CRISPR, especially in humans and especially in, in the human germline to create heritable changes in DNA is being openly discussed. And you may, some folks listening may be aware that very recently, just in the last two weeks, we saw a release of an important report from the National Academies in America and the United Kingdom uh, a uh, Royal Society in the UK uh, that took a deep dive into the issue of human genome editing, in particular in uh, human embryos, and made important recommendations for how the global scientific and clinical communities can move forward, knowing that 
this uh, we have this this capability now to to uh, edit the DNA of, of embryos, but uh, but clearly the technology is not ready for that type of application, nor have we had the kinds of deep societal discussions that would need to, to, to preface any use of that type. So I'm cautiously optimistic that we will have a, have a forum, forum now for encouraging that kind of global, ongoing global discussion, and that scientists will play a very important role in this, uh, this, this whole issue of making sure that the CRISPR technology in particular is used responsibly and that we can advise governments and regulatory commissions appropriately as the technology continues to advance. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and also for your leadership in this. I think, you know, people really look up to uh, to the leading scientists here to also set a moral course. Uh, Peter, you want to add something to this? Well, a little bit. Um, just to reiterate, uh, Norwich will always be capable uh, of abuse uh, as well as being capable of being, being put to good thing uses. It is important that we admit that, um, that we manage it, but I don't think there's any option. You, you cannot stop the world, and even if there were no knowledge creation, the actuality of the world would change in the way that the risks would change, so we, we will always have this thing to, to manage, really. Um, I, I'd just like to say one thing um, to amplify this and the previous points. The importance of education, we, we've alluded to the difficulty in translating knowledge now, the difficulty in knowing how to manage it, um, the difficulty in persuading people that knowledge creation per se is, is, is useful. All of these things are issues where, which bring to the fore the importance of education that that many, many people are educated in a way that they can appreciate the complexity of the actual scientific knowledge. And I think very importantly, it, it would be important to teach with greater emphasis the way in which that knowledge flow is created. I, I think that's often misunderstood. And together with this misunderstanding are many of the concerns you're bringing up the difficulty of valuing knowledge where the usefulness is not immediately apparent uh, and the fear that comes from people who uh, quite rightly are, are suspicious about things that they don't understand. So I want to take this opportunity for really emphasizing the societal importance of, of education. Thank you so much for making that, that, that absolutely crucial point and, and just Indeed, that it's not only about uh, communicating the facts of science, but also the methods in which we actually come to these, uh, these facts with all the uncertainties included. Uh, uh, Chris, I want to turn to you because another fear that has been around is about AI, robots, uh, possible job loss. I know you have written about that, you know, these new technologies can be, they can dramatically increase the quality of life by raising productivity and new products, but they can also instill fears of you know, technological unemployment. Uh, what, what do you feel the role of, of the scientific community is in to kind of addressing and informing society and policymakers and politicians about this? I think the main role of the scientific community here, and, and that's uh, not only economists, but also outside economics, is that this technology can be used for uh, social good. It can be used to complement labor, to have uh, labor and, and the new technology, AI working together. Um, it, 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 we do need, of course, to educate uh, people in a different way. And I've written also about what kinds of different kinds of education we would need to work together with AI and generally improve uh, living standards in a way that uh, would be more inclusive and benefit more people. Health, of course, is extremely important, but also work conditions, uh, flexibility at work. Um, as an alternative, the technology could just be used to throw workers out of jobs, use the machinery to produce, and bring benefits to a few. And which way we direct our research 
and uh, give incentives as well as possibilities for people to adopt it will de depend very much on uh, the, the way that uh, science, scientific research is done and the incentives, of course, that uh, companies will have because ultimately we have to depend on companies to adopt uh, technology in a way that is more friendly uh, to workers. Now, I've, I've studied the problem a lot over the last, uh, last five years. A lot of the, uh, the kind of panic writing in economics, unfortunately, is based more on the capabilities of this technology. They say, oh, no, AI can do things that we cannot understand. They can play chess in a way that no one can beat them. Imagine what they can do at work. It's going to be a disaster. But it doesn't have to be. It, it can be used in a way that will make the worker more productive and happier at work and leave the interesting jobs to the worker and let the machines do the boring jobs. That's possible as well. And that's where we need... Um, research to go along with um, incentives given to the companies with government policy to um, bring the new technology into society for everyone's good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, uh, we're very happy to have an uh, astronomer here uh, because, you know, I think, Irina, we all are jealous of the way in which uh, your field is able to appeal to the general public you know, black holes or exoplanets or possible life on Venus, it all appears on the front pages of the newspapers. Um, it seems a little bit like a paradox, right? That, uh, that the things that are most distant uh, are uh, appealing to the, uh, to, to the public interest. But you know, what can we do with that? You know, uh, education was mentioned. You know, how can we make our fascination with the universe um, help the interest uh, of society in general in the fruits of science? Yes, indeed. Um, I personally started out as a chemist and then only later moved into astronomy. And I must say that astronomy is much easier to talk about to the general public than, than, than chemistry. Um, as you say, uh, black holes, water black holes, uh, the biggest explosions in the universe, uh, the possibility of life elsewhere in the universe, are we alone? Those are some of the biggest questions and they appeal to many people. They appeal to our, our, our big own cultural uh, yearning, so to say. Um, but, uh, but they appeal especially to young children and that's the interesting part there has been a study done in oslo in 2010 and it's now being actually uh, repeated um the raw so-called raw study and they asked you know children what what are the questions that you're interested in and astronomy and space science and these questions that we just talked about they were at the very top and they didn't distinguish between girls or boys they were equally interested in these questions and so that i think is the big advantage that we have is to use astronomy as a low threshold uh, tool basically to get people to get young children interested in sciences not in astronomy but in sciences in general just to pull them in and uh, and, and 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 make them interested uh, in this and then i think you know we can we can work uh, you know further <laughs> than uh, uh, towards uh, uh, training the young people um, to, and getting the brightest minds to solve these uh, big questions. Thank you, uh, Irina. Um, no, science is a global enterprise. Um, no, as some would say, it's even a universal, certainly in terms of Irina. Uh, and uh, this panel is a, is a good, good example. We have speakers on the West Coast, the East Coast of the US, uh, in, in Britain, in, in the Netherlands. Um, but also, I think we are hosted uh, in Brussels. This is uh, this is an um, these are the research innovation days of the European Commission. So I want to you know somehow um, ask all of you to think about you know what does the, what how does local culture influence scientific research and particularly what are the strengths and challenges of Europe and frontier research. And let's start with you, Jennifer. You, uh, you have the advantage of having an outside view. Uh, I know that um, you, know, you and, and your research has resonated extremely well with the, the old tech culture in the Bay Area. Uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of entrepreneurial spirit. Um, if you look at Europe, you know, you have any recommendations 
uh, what Europe should do to create such a stimulating environment? Or do you sit, see certain strength that um, Europe should capitalize upon? Oh, that's a wonderful question. I think about this a lot, actually, because I am a scientist who has always done fundamental research. And so for me, the, the whole world of CRISPR and, and all of the things that have happened over the last eight years have really opened the you know my own eyes and my own opportunities in ways that I couldn't have predicted or expected before. And it's been a lot of fun. It's I, I love uh, meeting new people and, and and working with people that come to science or technology from different perspectives. And that's absolutely what's happened uh, for me here in in California, here in the Bay Area in particular. I think in Europe, um, I have many colleagues uh, in in Europe who I feel very very close to scientifically. Uh, certainly the foundational work that we did in the CRISPR field was uh, an international collaboration with the lab of Emmanuel Charpentier, who was at the time in Sweden, and her student, uh, Chris Chylinski in Vienna. And, um, you know, we, we, uh, we've really valued the opportunities that have come from those different scientific perspectives coming together. I think for... Um, you know, for, for in terms of, of thinking about opportunities, especially in entrepreneurship and, um, and, and international collaboration in, in science and technology, I see some really exciting things happening uh, in Europe, honestly, and, and, and in the UK. It's, uh, it's been amazing to see the ways that, um, you know, academic groups and, and institutes have partnered with companies. We see this very much to be the case with, with CRISPR. Um, you know, the, the ways that, that some of the CRISPR companies have sponsored research in academic groups to advance the technology, I think, has been foundational to the applications that we're seeing, especially in biomedical science right now. And so I, I think we should just do, do more of that, you know, uh, really encourage uh, scientists to, to do the work that they envision and to partner where it makes sense, whether it's with other academics or uh, whether it's with companies. And I can say that, you know, in my own experience, um, I, you know, started off in a very, in a very um, uh, traditional kind of academic setting where there was a lot of suspicion about companies and, you know, feeling that uh, that was, uh, if you worked with a company you were crossing over to the dark side, people would even use that that terminology. And I see that, that really changing uh, now, at least here in the U.S., that, you know, there's a, a feeling that uh, we, can, we can work together, we can have, uh, we can come to problems with, uh, you know, different backgrounds, even different motivations for solving those problems. And, uh, and work together very productively to do things, especially when it comes to applying science to solving real world problems that wouldn't be possible by either companies or academic groups alone. So I think more of that encouraging, more of that kind of partnership is, is really important. Um, that's, that's wonderful and uh, great also we have this kind of very fluent situation where uh, you know, the various kind of points of view are coming together. Um, now, Europe is of course an interesting model too because it has, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting mix of collaboration and, 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 and competition. And uh, I want to go back to, to you, Avina. You know, I think you, you have spoken about this before that um, you know, uh, could this be in some sense a, a, a model for, for the rest of the world uh, since we will not have a world government any anytime soon? <laughs> Well, yes, indeed. Uh, I think Europe has done incredibly well in, um, in especially over the last 20 years, in, in coming together in large collaborations, especially for building new infrastructures, whether that is in space or on the ground. Um, and so, uh, and, and in building the uh, instruments together for that. So, so I think in that sense, Europe has done fantastic. Uh, but then, you know, there needs to be some competition as well, because science thrives also by having uh, a a little bit being challenged uh, from other sides. So, um, and I think that's the good uh, thing that then happens. Then uh, once you start to do the scientific exploitation of those facilities, 
is, you know, then you uh, then you create sort of a little bit this tension uh, between different groups that have different data sets. So I think uh, Europe at this very moment has a very healthy um, uh, mix, so to say, of both collaboration and competition. Um, which sometimes I don't see at the same level in, in some of the other continents. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we're getting close to the end, and I, I actually now want to turn to uh, what I would almost like to jokingly call the $100 billion question. Namely, uh, given where we are right now, and given the state of science and technology, what would you your argument be to convince policymakers and politicians to support discovery research or frontier research at the appropriate levels. Now we heard many arguments, but if you want to, if you have the uh, the one minute uh, discussion with uh, with a minister or a president or a prime minister, uh, what would your elevator pitch be to make the case for frontier research? And uh, I uh, want to uh, move first to, to Chris. As an economist, perhaps you, you have good practice in making that argument. My argument would be that uh, there are wonderful things happening in science and they could be wonderful for uh, society as a whole. And without frontier economic research, we're not going to uh, succeed in doing that. All this research coming out of science and economics, because economics is a science, as we know, uh, would be wasted if we don't know how to use it uh, for the benefit of um, society, better productivity, better living uh, standard. So if you want to see the fruits of scientific research be put to good use, then um, you, you better uh, take seriously frontier research in economics and funding generously. Do you think I'll convince them? <laughs> I think that was very convincing. Um, uh, Peter, I want to, to move to you. Um, you know, again, you know, with, uh, this is, is this kind of paradox that we are like in the midst of science. We have never seen so much kind of scientific research being discussed on, on television, on, in the newspapers. Um, and yet you, you also made the argument, you know, that in some sense we're talking about almost the eternal truth here, something that's deeply ingrained in society. Um, how would you make the case right now for support for the kind of research that led you in the end to a Nobel Prize? Well, I, I hope that the uh, sort of conversations that we've had, the um, articulation of the very indirect ways in which science promotes society would be um, persuasive. Um, in a general form, I, I don't want to give a specific example as to why that might might be the case. I, I, I think there are so many. Um, if I might twist the question a little bit, Robert, what I think we have to ask the question, why are we not being persuasive? I, I, I believe, um, at least in the UK, I'll, I'll give you one figure. Um, the UK spent 13 billion hosting the Olympic Games. Its annual research bill for the MRC is, is less than one billion. So I, th I think we do have to uh, admit that we've got a problem in persuasion. Um, what I would like to see happen, I think, is more emphasis on on education as to how science derives the facts that we learn. Uh, we have a dichotomy, at least in the UK system, we either learn the humanities, the history, uh, or, or, or we learn science, which is mainly taught as a series of facts. I would like to see a greater emphasis in history on teaching history through science and in science teaching science through history. At that point, I believe I would be much more persuasive to the general public in articulating the cause that we've just been discussing, uh, how knowledge will be used in unexpected way to create valuable new knowledge. And I think that's the single most important point that we have to get across. Thank you, that's absolutely excellent. Uh, Avina, we just said, you know, that uh, you have no trouble uh, engaging the, the general public, uh, apart from finding life on another planet, uh, 
what kind of advice do you have in, in order to, uh, I would almost say like channel that interest in the general public to a corresponding warm feeling among politicians and policymakers? Yeah, so I, I think one of the main messages is indeed that, you know, basic science provides also inspiration. Uh, it raises curiosity. And as we also heard from the commissioner, curiosity is what ultimately leads also to innovations. Maybe a little bit later, but curiosity is a key word on this. The other thing I would like to stress is perspective. Um, what science, basic science can give is the perspective, you know, taking a step back, looking, for example, at our little Earth from space and seeing that we are living on this tiny rock in the middle of nowhere. That homes, brings home the message that we better take good care of our planet. It also brings home some modesty. You know, we're just this little speck in the big universe. Um, and also... Um, the fact uh, that, uh, you know, we're all under the same sky. We're all actually world citizens under that same sky. Thank you so much. Very poetic and, and true. And it's always very difficult to speak after an astronomer. But uh, still, Jennifer, I want to give you, so to say, the last word. Uh, if, if perhaps also because you are somehow the embodiment, I would say, of, um, you know, how 21st century looks like, where you just said, you know, everything is coming together. We are uh, in this incredibly technological revolution. What's your one minute elevator speech? I would point out that since the end of the Second World War, both Europe and America have invested a lot of money in the science and technology that has driven our economies on both sides of the Atlantic over these last few decades. And the result of that is where we are right now. We have this, as you said, uh, Robert, this incredible convergence of technologies, not only in the biological sciences, but in, in, in astronomy, in physics, in economics, in, in multiple areas where we see opportunities to do things that uh, were not possible even a short time ago. So I think that the best argument to our, our, uh, our governments and to our taxpayers um, is that that kind of investment, imagine what that kind of investment is going to do over the next 50 or 70 years. It's going to be extraordinary. We can hardly imagine the opportunities that lie ahead if we make that kind of investment in fundamental science that drives forward our, our economies and, and uh, new discoveries and technologies. Well, thank you so much. And I would kind of add that perhaps uh, the best argument are, I can offer is the four of you, because you, you really uh, exemplify uh, the power uh, persuasiveness and attraction of, of the scientific enterprise. So I, I want to thank you very much for this. I think it, it's been clear that the adventure of science has only been just begun. We have incredible opportunities and also very urgent needs. And uh, I think you know we learn uh, much more uh, as we have done in this hour about ourselves, about our society, about the world, even about universe. And I also want to thank you for you know, outlining the special role for Europe. You know, modern science in its broader sense, including all fields, was in, in some way also a gift of Europe to the world. And uh, as we, Irina said, you know, this model friendly competition can also be an inspiration for the world too. Now, uh, since I'm actually uh, sitting here at uh, Einstein's Institute, I have to end uh, by an Einstein quote, which is one of my favorites, that imagination is more important than knowledge for knowledge is limited to all we know and understand, while imagination embraces the entire world. So uh, with these words, I want to thank you again. I want to thank Commissioner Gabriel for uh, launching this discussion. I want to thank the EOC and the Kavli for foundations for everything you're doing for supporting excellent research, but also hosting this session. And of course, I also want to thank you, the audience, for being with us today. Thank you very much for joining our session. And thank you again our four panelists.
Wow, that's some great inspiration on blue skies from Nobel Prize winners, from Kavli Prize winners. And thanks for your inspiration and your energy today as we sign off on the plenary channel of European uh, Innovation uh, uh, Research and Innovation Days 2020. We're going to see you tomorrow. Bring that inspiration and that energy back. We're going to have a lot more. We're going to hand out more prizes. We're going to have panels uh, on the future of work, fighting cancer, the COVID-19 response. And we get to talk to an astronaut. So in the meantime, take a look at some of the things online. If you missed any panels, you can look back at those. Check out, check out these uh, other uh, action activities that are on the, uh, on the website. And we'll see you tomorrow. Have a good evening.